uh, today I'm going to be talking about um, some of the work I've been doing in my doctoral studies so far. Um, I'm a rising fourth year uh, doctoral student, so this has sort of been um, some of my work to date, not all of it. Um, and I'm mostly going to be talking about uh, one study, um, and that is um, uh, my master's thesis, and it's a uh, conceptual change induced by analogical reasoning sparks aha moments. Um, and as um, was I was just introduced, um, my research interests are sort of around the cognitive and affective mechanisms of learning and creativity, and I'm particularly interested in sort of epistemic motivation, what sort of motivates learning and creative problem solving, um, uh, curiosity and these aha experiences, and I'm also really interested in the pedagogical use of analogy. And the work I'll be presenting today, um, I was advised by my two uh, doctoral advisors, uh, John Kunius and Leela Krisiku, as well as um, my um, committee members, uh, Zoe Zhang and uh, Keith Holyoke. So um, as a background, um, my sort of claim is that analogical reasoning um, is actually can be a very affective experience. Um, I don't need to convince everyone here, provide a definition of analogical reasoning, but um, analogical mapping does involve you know, identifying common patterns of relationships among the constituent elements of one or more situations. And uh, through this process, Analogical reasoning sort of extends and expands knowledge structures in ways that are epistemologically productive. So analogical mapping actually creates knowledge um, via these sort of novel inferences um, and affordances. And so the claim here is that changes in representational structures that are catalyzed by analogical mapping can, and in big sort of parentheses, in certain situations uh, be accompanied by positive affective experiences of surprise, joy, or pleasure. Not all instances of analogical reasoning, obviously, but certainly some. And um, I don't think that that is a um, wild claim, but it is noteworthy, I think, that most of the research on analogy often ignores its phenomenological qualities. Um, to my knowledge, really, analogical reasoning is kind of mostly treated as a cold cognitive process not necessarily because I think people don't think it involves affect, but um, my argument is that we should pay attention to affect um, and it can sort of elucidate um, novel patterns. So, um, you know, we can think about there's several sort of circumstances that come to mind when we think about the affective consequences of analogical reasoning. Um, one such situation is, you know, humor. Um, analogical mapping is a sort of common mechanism of jokes, um, sort of making these sort of novel and non-obvious correspondences provokes laughter. Um, so, you know, like comparing a ballerina to a dog peeing on a fire hydrant is sort of silly. Um, even just more broadly, um, metaphorical language can sort of be affectively sort of provocative even beyond the emotional content of the words itself. So there's something about sort of making novel associations that is sort of, that can be emotional. Um, then sort of getting into more of what I'm gonna be talking about today. Um, analogy when it's used as a pedagogical tool can often yield affective responses. You can think about a situation in a classroom um, where a student is um, sort of uncertain or confused by a subject, a well-placed analogical explanation um, creates clarity that can sort of um, provoke a sort of like, ooh, or aha response, like I get it, like the sort of release of understanding something. Um, and also um, uh, analogies are implicated in insightful problem solving. Um, there's a lot of sort of famous examples from the history of science whereby, you know, uh, these eminent creative discoveries came about uh, spontaneously because an individual sort of like made an analogical comparison to something that provided an appropriate model. Um, so a really famous example is Kikuli, um, sort of insightful discovery of the structure of the benzene molecule and the sort of myth goes that he was looking into a fire and he was really confused and all of a sudden the image of an Ouroboros popped into his head, which is the mythical uh, a snake that eats its own tail and he sort of realized that benzene had to be a ring. And so this is sort of like spontaneous 
analogical comparison that afforded him a model by which to understand his data. Um, and so um, talking to a group of analogy researchers, I thought it would just be useful to define insight or what I mean by insight in this circumstance. So um, when I say insight, I mean a sort of very specific um, phenomenon associated with problem solving and learning, um, not like insight there's like a general sense of insight, like, oh, it provided insight into, you know, bat feeding patterns. Um, this is, an insight here is like a cognitive phenomenon where you suddenly understand something, you suddenly solve a problem. So um, Cuneo's and Beeman's definition is that it's a sudden reinterpretation of the elements of a problem, situation, scheme, or percept into a more coherent or appropriate interpretation. Um, that does not mean that it has to be in a problem-solving context, but it often is. Um, insights are intentionally and metacognitively sudden. This sort of an all or nothing, you all of a sudden realize what the solution is. And the concept of the insight yields valuable and surprising inferences. And a sort of hallmark of insight is this affective aha response, which is characterized by pleasure. Usually it feels good and also this metacognitive feeling of certainty that like you have confidence in the solution that feels right. Um, so that sort of goes to um, suggest that in, insight is a, is a metacognitive phenomenon or an epi phenomenon. And um, I'm not at all the first person who has noted a theoretical relationship between insight and analogical reasoning. Um, there's many more people who have noted this, but it's really been theoretical. So um, researchers have pointed out, similar to what I did before, you know, oh, insight appears to like accompany these spontaneous analogical comparisons. Um, but no or very few, very little empirical work has actually be, been done on this. Um, anecdotally, in these seminal studies of analogical transfer um, by Jick and Holyoke, the researchers, like they just mentioned that it appeared that the participants had these eureka-like experiences when they did actually spontaneously transfer um, the, uh, the, the structure from uh, uh, target um, uh, to, uh, <laughs> when they successfully spontaneously transferred uh, the solution. They weren't studying insight, they didn't measure it, but they did note that that appeared to take place. Um, and uh, Kevin Dunbar in his in vivo studies of sort of scientific reasoning um, suggested that, uh, or, or noted that insights tended to occur um, when distant analogies were invoked to sort of explain or reason about novel phenomena. So when scientists or researchers were sort of talking together, trying to figure something out, or if someone was trying to explain something to another, particularly from a different domain, it, when a distant analogy was invoked to try to make sense of a situation that yielded these insight feelings. And that was not the case when analogies were invoked that were from the same domain or that were um, more associatively close. Um, so overall, uh, there's a lot of overlap between the analogical reasoning literature and the insight literature. Both of these phenomena are implicated in creative problem solving, uh, learning and scientific reasoning. And sort of the common mechanism seems to be that they're, they induce or are at least incidental to representational change in knowledge structures. Um, and again, despite a lot of anecdotal and theoretical evidence, um, this relationship has not really been empirically tested. Um, on the side of insight, um, researchers have pointed out that there's this potential functional metacognitive role for what aha moments are, that they're this intrinsic reward for learning and comprehension. Um, and I really like that interpretation of aha moments. Um, it makes sense uh, evolutionarily speaking, not to sort of like make up evolutionary psychology explanations for things, but it makes sense that we should be rewarded for understanding things and for comprehending things. And particularly when that understanding occurs in this sort of like sudden surprising fashion, um, it's very affectively salient and it feels good. And um, one of my favorite papers is a paper by Alison Gopnik, she's a developmental psychologist at Berkeley and the paper is called Explanation as Orgasm. Um, maybe some of you are familiar with it. And she basically posits um, 
you know, receiving causal explanations or figuring things out is akin, the, the, the aha experience that we feel is akin to what an orgasm is for learning. It's the reward for doing it. Um, learning and exploration and creative problem solving are hard. There's not necessarily an immediate payoff. So it makes sense that we should have these like affective, pleasurable responses um, when we do. And um, it has potentially really enhanced um, our ability as a species to, to be creative. Um, a very recent um, paper just came out, um, which sort of demonstrated that the strength of the magnitude of aha responses um, reflects a magnitude of change in the cognitive system. So if you're given sort of something that's uncertain, an uncertain percept or an opaque percept, an aha response or the strength of the aha response sort of reflects the change or the collapse in uncertainty. Um, and uh, more generally, um, going back all the way to the Gestalt psychologist, theories of insights oppose that these moments reflect sudden representational change. It's sort of implicit um, or non-monotonic learning as opposed to more associative learning. So it's all or nothing, jump in understanding. And um, it's worth noting that this is a very widely accepted theory of insight. People take it for granted almost. If you sort of didn't understand a problem and now you understand it, it makes sense, your representation obviously changed. But um, the empirical evidence, direct empirical evidence for this is actually kind of limited and it's worth actually uh, poking at that question. And I think part of it is because of the limitations of existing insight tasks. Um, a lot of them are uh, were developed in a problem solving tradition. There's only one right answer. You either get it or you don't. So it does obviously show that representational changes occurred but there's no room for variability. And a lot of them lack sort of sufficient semantic complexity to study higher order cognitive processes. And that's what I'm interested in. <laughs> so I was really interested in sort of developing a new way of studying insight. And I was also really interested in analogy. So um, what I would posit here is that, it, and I don't know how familiar most people here are with insight tasks, but there's a sort of range, there's a lot of different tasks um, there's a range in terms of, I would say, their ecological validity, how much they actually reflect what it's like to have an insight in the real world. Um, I don't really think that a matchstick problem like, is the greatest insight ever. It doesn't feel like what it feels when you really understand something that like, is valuable to your own research, but it does get at some of the components. And then this other dimension I would call utility for cognitive research, which, you know, there's lots of different ways to do cognitive research, but um, particularly for neuroimaging, which is what I had in mind, you need tons of stimuli that are very equivalent and that are sort of tightly controlled and that you can quantify. And so um, there's a sort of trade-off here. And so my argument is that verbal analogies sort of sit in this sweet spot. They have a lot of ecological validity because we use anal analogies all the time. Um, and we can make lots of stimuli. They're pretty simple and we can control for them really well. Um, and so the um, sort of theoretical mechanism of what an analogical insight is, is that if insight experiences are the, the sudden metacognitive marker of some shift in mental representation, um, they sort of indicate that you've discovered a new way of making sense of the elements of a situation. You start off with a sort of incomplete mental model or a um, erroneously organized mental model. And an analogy provides structure for information that's unstructured or incomplete. And especially if you understand the target analog really well, the mapping process is almost instantaneous. And so it can give rise to that feeling of insight because once you realize the correspondence, it's very sudden that your representation shifts. And this is a schematic of uh, Dunker's radiation problem from a paper by Melissa Schilling. Um, so I'll pause there. Does anyone have any sort of like questions about any of the background so far before I get into the actual study itself? Josh has put a question in the chat. Do, do you want to ask that, Josh? Or okay, sure. Oh, no, no, no yeah. that's that's all right. Um, I have to. So the question is about remembering things. Now I have to remember the question. Um, so I, I'm wondering: <laughs> are there are, are there other cognitive phenomena um, 
that have a similar, um, call it a, an ecstasy associated with them mm-hmm. to, um, to, to insights. And the one that I was thinking of is I was trying to remember, um, you know, <laughs> maybe I'll show my age with this one. I was trying and trying and trying to remember the name of an actor and I could picture their face. And I was thinking and thinking and thinking, and this went on for hours, maybe even days. And then finally the name came to me and it was this ecstatic experience. And I, I don't know what to, what to pin it to, right? Like maybe it was relief that I'm not actually starting to have failing memory. Maybe it was just the, um, the resolution of having had that um, kind of uh, suspended uncertainty and then that, and then that resolved. But I'm curious, um, do you know, uh, like I said, qualitatively, it felt similar, but do you know the, yeah. the neurological underpinnings? Are they similar in, th- yeah. in those two types of experiences or across broader experiences than, than just insights? Yeah. So what I think you're describing is the tip of the tongue phenomenon, right? So you know that you know it, but you just can't access it. And it really feels almost horrible, like an itch. And like, it'll suddenly come to mind. Um, and it feels great, like an insight. And I do think they're very similar. People have noted that they're very similar. Um, there's a sort of access problem that's equivalent, I think so. And often in insightful problem solving, there's a sort of intuition or sort of vague feeling like I feel like I could know it. Um, and it's just that you're not in the right sort of psychological state in order for those weak associations to sort of find each other and click. And so that's why people have insights in the shower or when they're looking at the window or something, you have to be sort of relaxed. And then all of a sudden, you know, that idea will will pop into your mind. And I think what the difference between tip of the tongue and the sort of true creative insight is, is that tip of the tongue it's a memory retrieval failure. And so you already sort of know the information, you just can't access it. Whereas an insight would be the, a novel inference or connection that you're making. So you sort of are making a new connection between existing puzzle pieces in your memory versus a retrieval failure for a piece of information. But that's my theory. Yeah, no, I mean, it's, fun, it's funny because we because this came up on another, another of these calls. I was wondering um, the sequencing like, is it conceivable that what's actually happening with an insight is a retrieval? It's just that the experience of, of realizing that you know the answer happens after your brain figures out the answer. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's interesting to think about sort of the different time courses of these. Um, I see another. Um, yeah. Yeah, a it's question a, from Katerina. Oh, the mic's it's, it's unavailable. Just, can you, can you? Yeah. Um, she that. says, historically, insight is defined as a solution after impasse. Some researchers that aha moments in solving after impasse are different phenomena. What do you think about it? Um, yeah, so uh, some people would argue that impasse or like having a problem and then not being able to solve it for some period of time is a requirement for insight to happen. Um, I think that currently the uh, view is that it's not necessarily or it's not necessary all the time. Um, you can certainly have an insight about some a problem that you're not actively trying to solve. Um, something can still be very novel. Um, it can create new coherence in mind. So sort of like you can think of hearing a new explanation or a fact about something. You weren't looking for that information, but it reorganizes your existing understanding from information that was just offered to you. Um, so I think that that's the same experience is what insight is. And um, the definition of insight that I use is that it's the sudden shift in mental representation. A sudden shift in mental representation can occur in a variety of situations. Um, It doesn't always have to happen after impasse, but it definitely makes it more satisfying. (laughs) Um, Okay, Um, if there's no more questions at this time, I will move on. Um, So the goals of the present study were so sort of one to adapt verbal analogies for use as an insight task and I um, admit that I'm coming at this as with interest in insight and with interest in analogical reasoning and I'm in a creativity lab now so there's a lot of sort of value for insight researchers in developing a new insight task. Um, For analogy researchers I think it's really interesting to think about 
how it's an affective experience associated with sort of creative analogical reasoning and they're two sides of the same coin. Um, the sort of other goal was to examine the conditions in which analog analogical reasoning gives rise to feelings of insight. We know sort of from the existing evidence that it's probably sort of these distant analogies, but what kind of tasks, what kind of analogies under what circumstances and um, how do sort of underlying differences in mood or temperament or reasoning abilities influence that? Um, and uh, lastly, uh, and I argue that using um, sort of these creative analogies affords the possibility of measuring changes in mental representations that aren't necessarily available from existing insight tasks. So this is a, a good opportunity to sort of expand um, evidence in that area. Um, so the methods of the current study, um, we developed a sort of novel or kind of novel set of 44 paraverbal analogies and they were adapted from Adam Green's analogy set um, wherein there's a sort of within versus cross domain analogy distinction. And out of all of the um, possible types of analogies that we were considering using, those seemed to be the closest, but they needed tweaking in order to sort of be really insightful. And the after a lot of piloting and trial and error, um, the um, sort of picture that emerged was that, um, uh, so these stimuli have an A, B, and C, D pair that are sort of very similar to one another. They're at the same level of sort of concreteness. They're within domain analogies. Um, uh, on each trial, we would either introduce an EF pair that was consistent with the first two or a GH pair that was what we would call expansive. So the analogy is still a valid analogy, but it sort of is a departure from the um, first two word pairs um, and changes uh, and sort of makes more abstract the meaning of the analogy. I think it's easier to just show you what I mean by that. Um, so this is an example of a consistent analogy. So runway is to plane as launch pad is to helicopter as a uh, diving board is to diver. So it's this physical thing off of which another physical thing jumps or is launched. Um, the expansive pair is preschool student. So this sort of changes, if you start off with runway plane launch pad helicopter, and then you see preschool student, it's sort of, it's still a valid analogy. It still means sort of launch in a more metaphorical sense, um, but now it sort of is a broader, a more uh, distantly associated um, analogy. And then here's another example, um, necklace is to neck as bracelet is to wrist, as ring is to finger. Um, and if you looked at that analogy, you'd probably say it's a the piece of jewelry and the body part that it goes on. Um, but then if I changed it to the expansive satellite earth, um, suddenly you sort of have to reinterpret the first two instead of sort of it's jewelry, it's something that encircles another thing. Um, and um, I haven't gone into detail about like the year that it took to figure this out just through trial and error, but the uh, formula seems to be, you know, high frequency words, the words are not hard, but the relations are non obvious. This is accessible, but the relation is, is interesting. And each relation had to be different um, in, in terms of all the analogy pairs. So, um, because this was sort of adapted from an existing analogy set and it sort of has space validity, um, we would sort of argue that, um, uh, you know, we, by requiring participants to sort of do this analogical mapping, the expansive analogies induce a more abstract interpretation, which sort of expands the analogical relationship. By contrast, the consistent analogies sort of reinforce or maintain that initial uh, schematic representation. Um, we validated that these differences were real um, using existing measures, um, uh, a measured lexical similarity using word to vec which is used a lot in analogy research and semantic distance, which is used a lot in research on creativity and um, just a lot of research, obviously. So um, we just wanted to validate that 
within each pair and across all of the pairs that the expansive and the consistent analogies were sort of quantitatively different. And um, these are just the distributions of those. So there's some overlap, but every single pair was significantly different. The expansive analogies had sort of greater uh, relational dissimilarity and greater semantic distance than the consistent pairs. Um, and uh, we also asked human raters um, who were naive to the experimental design, um, how much does the third pair in the analogy change your understanding of the overall analogy on a scale from zero to 10? And the expansive analogies were rated much higher. So we have a lot of confidence that this reflects sort of like real differences um, and here's just another way of looking at that. So this is the multidimensional scale plot. Um, and you can see that sort of GH pairs are farther away in this sort of multidimensional space. So they are, the others are sort of clustered together at least on the x-axis and the GH pairs are farther away. And all these measures were intercorrelated. They're basically measuring the same thing um, in case we needed any more um, certainty. So the procedure that we uh, used in these experiments are, um, so there's 40 trials. Um, each participant was shown a fully randomized set of 20 expansive and 20 consistent analogies. So it was completely random which one they were gonna see and whether or not they would get the consistent or the expansive ending. Um, so the first uh, page that they were shown just had the first two pairs that were always sort of closely related to one another. And um, then they were asked to generate a description of the analogy. So provide a explanation of sort of what is the concept that the, the analogy represents just as in its two pair form. Once they provided that explanation, um, the third pair was revealed and they were asked to sort of like press the button as soon as they um, knew and interpreted the, the analogy with the additional pair. And then they were asked to describe the analogy again. Now, what is the concept? what is the concept that the analogy represents. And after we got them to provide ratings of um, how difficult they found the analogy to understand, um, their confidence in their solution and a rating of the aha response they had when they understood the full analogy on a scale from zero to 10, where zero was no aha moment at all and 10 was a very strong aha moment. And um, there are sort of differences in opinion, in opinion on whether you should measure aha in a continuous way or in sort of a binary yes, no. Um, we went with a continuous measure um, and uh, yeah. So the sort of logic of this is that we could uh, code differences in participants, the uh, descriptions of the analogies before and after that third pair. And the more their explanation changed, we uh, hypothesized that that would be associated with the magnitude of the aha response that they reported. So bigger changes in their description, which would reflect changes in the way that they understood the analogy and of their internal representation, we thought would be associated with the strength of aha responses. And uh, the way that we uh, quantified that was um, we coded it as a zero if they provided basically the same description twice, they didn't change it at all. We coded it as a two if the meaning of their description clearly changed, um, the verb or the active noun used in the, in the sentence changed, the relationship that they're describing is different. And then there's a sort of gray zone in between where maybe they said it a little bit differently, but we couldn't necessarily say like, yes, they think it's different now. Um, and I will note that we did not code the responses for accuracy or quality. Um, this was a very open-ended sort of exploratory first step. And so if people didn't provide a response or they provided something that was obviously wrong or they didn't follow instructions, we excluded them. But anything that sort of like was valid, um, we included. Um, I think in the future, we will do a manipulation where we're actually coding for accuracy, but for now it was sort of more exploratory. Can um, I jump so, in there, Christine? Uh, yep. Karen Walker's asking, uh, could you say a bit more about what it means to have a continuous aha experience? Uh, yes, so, um, uh, so I think that there are, I shouldn't say I think, um, 
evidence suggests that you know there's differences in sort of how big of an aha versus like experience that you have. Um, you can think about the most mind blowing experience insight that you ever had, and it sort of changed so much of how you understood something, and it was affectively stronger and had a bigger impact. And we would contrast that with this sort of little aha experience where like, oh, wow, that's different. That's changed. Like I realize something different now. Um, we would consider that the same phenomenon, but I think there is a sort of like scale there. And I think it probably has to do with how much information or how much your cognitive system changes as a result, so if you have an insight about something that's very important to you, then it could change, it have very big implications. It'd be a very strong response. Um, that would be contrasted with something that's like interesting. Um, it also is sort of um, an answer to methodological, I think, limitations of measuring aha as in the binary. So if you just measure whether people say like they did or did not have an aha experience, um, you are, I think, um, making it harder to disambiguate between, or it's less clear what criteria people are using to say that they did have an aha experience. Or it's fine, but I think you get more with a continuous measure. People have done both for a long time, but previous research has shown that when you measure aha continuously, that you get a distribution of responses, which suggests that that is the actual affect is more of a distribution than a binary. Does that I think, your um, Karen's got a follow up if you want to jump jump in, Karen. Sorry, hey, sorry, I was having trouble unmuting. Oh, I see. I just got I just got permission. Um, hi, thank you for that. Yeah, I'm just trying to learn more about about insight um, and about how you are classifying these aha experiences. So, like, it, again, I'm new to this research, but in my mind, having an aha experience is something that's notable or, or sort of distinct from just the experience of learning in general. And so, mm -hmm. I guess you're using a relatively broad definition here, right? Which I guess is yeah. what's critical, which is that it's just any, it's just like the affective accompaniment, right, to to, to learning. And so, yeah. I guess in that sense, it's okay uh, that it's sort of defined in this broad way. Um, in my mind, the this notion of an aha or insight experience should be more specific to a particular type of learning, right? One that one that does something that's more dramatic. And so. Um, I guess that was kind of what I was looking for clarification on, um, but I think I just answered my own question, which is that you're sort of just using a broader definition um, of insight uh, than the one that I had in my head. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, uh, this is admittedly a bit of a broad um, definition of insight. And I think it is, I, uh, that was a decision in order to sort of capture that distribution. Um, I, I do have confidence that the way that the task is set up does sort of reflect at least the underlying mechanism that's present in a lot of like really powerful insights. So like in, in learning, you really realize something. Um, it's just really difficult to create those conditions in a laboratory. So um, this is one kind of proxy for that. Um, it's a different kind of proxy than some other insight tasks, which I think capture different aspects of the experience of what it's like to really have an insight in the real world. Um, so there's trade-offs. Uh, so this is sort of a conceptually rich task, but it's a broader um, definition of insight. Can it, um, just one, one more question? Yeah, yeah, just one more follow-up. So, but you would say that there's something unique about, I have a representation in my head and that changes as opposed to, I don't have a, I don't have a particular representation and I get a new one. So that's not, that's just learning. That's not necessarily having an aha experience. You have to sort of have something in mind already, right? That's how. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I yeah. got it. Thank you. So, um, uh, there is some evidence to this, although more work needs to be done, but, um, I think that aha experiences sort of happen in the region of proximal learning. Like you have to have, you have to know something about the topic in order for it to sort of like be shifted. Um, if you're just getting information for the first time, I think any positive affective experience that you're having as a result of that is sort of like novelty rather than 
aha, if that makes sense. So that's why it was also important in this task that we used um, like high frequency words. So this is information and like relations that people are already familiar with that they probably just didn't put them together before. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and then Richard said, um, it's interesting that aha feeling is a proxy for representational change. I wonder if that suggests other epistemic emotions, like surprising confusion might similarly attract. Um, yes, exactly. I am not sure if there's a question there, um, but I will keep going because I think I will be talking about that. Um, so the main hypotheses were that uh, we would see this sort of difference in the categories that the expansive analogies would be associated with stronger aha experiences. Um, also that they would be associated with greater conceptual change and that by, um, uh, uh, therefore, that greater conceptual change would be associated with greater aha strength, that it would track um, sort of linearly. And then um, we uh, did capture a bunch of individual differences um, measures. And so we did some exploratory analyses looking at sort of what um, sort of at uh, the individual level may be influencing these processes. Um, so the methods, so this was gonna be a neuroimaging study, um, but the pandemic happened. <laughs> so this became a two-part behavioral online study. Um, so we did this in two samples, um, one sample of undergraduates um, and an mTORC sample. Um, and in uh, both of those samples, we collected um, mood before and after, big five, the five-factor curiosity scale, trait reward sensitivity, and then there were some differences um, that I will also talk about later. Um, and so the results, so in terms of this uh, first hypothesis, um, expansive analogies did yield stronger aha ratings and consistent analogies. Um, this is over all of the analogies. So looking at it as sort of like these broad groups, this effect is stronger if you just look at um, each within each set, does the expansive analogy get a stronger aha rating than the consistent analogy? And because these were all randomized, um, this is a pretty strong effect. So there's this consistent, um, the expansive analogies consistently are rated stronger on aha ratings. And this effect is actually replicated a few times because I've done some other behavioral experiments. Um, expansive analogies were an unsurprisingly associated with greater conceptual change than the consistent analogies. Um, it's kind of what they were designed to do. So that's good sanity check. Um, but then across all, both the expansive and consistent sets, um, the magnitude of people's aha ratings did correspond to sort of the degree of change um, in their descriptions. Um, uh, this is probably not a perfect measure of representational change um, based on just like people giving input information in like text boxes. Um, but we did see this uh, strong linear relationship in both samples. Um, so this was exciting, um, suggesting that it's not only that the aha experience is just something that accompanies any feeling of learning, but that it actually scales with representational change. Um, then in terms of individual differences, um, the intensity and range of AHA ratings varied wildly across participants. So um, there are these sort of stable cognitive trait-like differences in people's tendencies to experience insight. Um, and we also know that um, uh, you know, there's response bias, so it was a 10 point scale. And we also know that there's individual differences in analogical reasoning. There should have been a citation there. Um, and so we wanted to understand sort of what measures were associated with differences between individuals in terms of their likelihood of rating their aha experiences as higher. Um, most people were all trending in the same direction, but for some people, not having an insight was like a zero and having an aha experience was a one. <laughs> And so those are sort of like the not super emotionally sort of like um, reactive people. And then some people were all, all over the place writing things really high, thought every single thing was interesting. Um, so just to sort of uh, go back, these were the individual measures that we collected. Um, we collected people's mood right before and right after all of the analogy trials. Um, 
uh, their big five, this five factor trait curiosity scale, um, which I really like. Um, and that was because um, if we take aha experiences to be the sort of uh, epistemic reward, curiosity is like the anticipation of reward. It's the appetite of response. So these two things might be related. Um, trait reward sensitivity. Um, so people's tendency to sort of derive pleasure from positive experiences. And um, in the um, uh, Drexel sample, we administered the semantic similarities test and the Wasteville Kevin Ravens. And the MTurk sample, we administered the adult ADHD subscale um, because there is some evidence that maybe sort of diminished executive control facilitates insight. Um, the sort of I'm still playing around with some of these analyses. So I just wanted to present sort of the most compelling finding, which is that um, in both samples, positive mood at the outset of the experiment was most strongly correlated with the strength of aha moments. Um, so this was sort of getting people's um, average measure of the strength of their aha moments so that we could actually uh, reflect this individual difference. Um, and so this was a fairly strong relationship in both samples um, and uh, this was not a manipulation. It was just whatever they were feeling that day um, at the start of the experiment. Um, and this makes sense. This is something that we actually predicted because positive mood is known to influence the frequency and accuracy of problem solved by insight and of creative problem solving more generally. So being in a positive mood does seem to um, positively influence people's experience or experiences of insight. Um, and it also makes them more accurate. Um, positive mood is also known or thought to improve cognitive control and attentional flexibility. Um, and so because this was such a strong um, individual difference and it did seem to account for a lot of the individual variation um, that we were seeing in the models at the trial level, um, we wanted to actually look to see if this was influencing those relationships um, that I described before. So the question becomes, uh, does positive mood influence the relationship between the analogy type on aha strength. So, um, you know, if you're in a positive mood, is it affecting your aha ratings? And what we see is that um, we see the same main effect where expansive analogies are rated higher than consistent analogies. And there's a main effect of positive mood. Being in a higher positive mood means you're just gonna rate your aha experiences more highly, but there was no interaction. Um, the same thing was for um, conceptual change. So um, if you are, I'm so sorry, the x-axis on this is labeled incorrectly because I did this at the last second. Um, the relationship between uh, changes in uh, descriptions of the analogies and aha strength was also not influenced by positive mood, although you see those two main effects. So um, I would argue that um, the positive affect seems to sort of increase the likelihood of having stronger aha moments, but it didn't affect the cognitive processes underneath. Um, I'm still trying to make sense of this, um, but then overall those same main effects uh, were consistent. So the expansive analogies were associated with the stronger aha moments and greater conceptual change, and that there was this uh, linear relationship between conceptual change and aha experiences, which provides evidence that those feelings are incidental to changes in mental representations. And particularly in this case, this was sort of like <laughs> conceptual learning. Um, more broadly, I would argue that this suggests that there's a role for measuring affect in analogical reasoning and when we measure conceptual change and that um, capturing affect uh, during analogical reasoning, particularly when we're investigating um, analogical mapping in the context of learning um, or creative problem solving could provide um, new perspectives and sort of a layer of information or data um, that was not necessarily considered before. Um, and this, uh, the evidence here is consistent with the notion that these aha moments are playing a metacognitive role during learning and creativity. Um, and so if these sort of creative analogical reasoning is a mechanism of creativity and learning, aha responses are sort of like an, uh, 
metacognitive um, marker that those shifts are occurring. And it suggests that sort of relational reasoning in particular like these broad associative creative analytical reasoning is affectively salient, um, which I think is really cool. Um, I have a few other slides, um, uh, but I'll pause there because that's sort of the end of this little um, conceptual bit. Um, if anyone has any questions or other comments. Okay, I'm not seeing yes, anything. If anyone has any questions, if you want to put your hands up or virtually put your hands up. Um, Josh has another question here. Uh, Paul, do you want to ask it, Josh? Oh, sure. Yeah. So I, I'm just wondering, were, were you able to measure um, the intensity of the aha experience um, against the, um, the subject's skillfulness at creating analogies? And by analogy, I was thinking, like, if I were to run a five-minute mile, I would be pretty excited about it. But most real athletes would think that was all in a day's work. And so I'm wondering if the if the insight breakthrough is is a bigger reward if you're if the task is a harder task for you. Um, yeah, so that's a good question. So um, we did capture those measures of difficulty and confidence, um, and um, in general, sort of the more difficult uh, uh, it was to sort of understand the stronger the aha experience was, and that makes sense, but it's sort of up to a certain point. If you don't understand the analogy, you're also not gonna have an aha moment because you didn't get it. So um, a more difficult analogy, and that was sort of the ideal circumstance, like if people saw the an analogy and then they sort of, it took them a second to realize what it was, that's sort of mimicking an impasse. Um, so those were associated with stronger aha moments, um, but it sort of still has to be accessible to you. Um, in terms of whether skill or experience in a domain makes you feel less insightful when you sort of like notice these things, I think it, yeah, it depends on your prior knowledge. If you like know a lot about something, you can make a novel inference and it doesn't necessarily feel insightful because it's not, you're already an expert. Um, I think the aha experiences are really about, like, they're instructive. It's like when you learn something, so you sort of have to be in the, in the spot knowledge-wise where you're able to learn and make inferences. Do you want to finish those slides, Christine? And then if you've got yeah. a couple more and then we can do questions after that. Yeah. Right. Um, so these are also probably, um, you know, I presented these to insight researchers uh, yesterday. Um, it's more to do with mood and reward and epistemic curiosity, but I think it has some implications for analogical reasoning as well. So just broadly, you know, if I haven't convinced you already, aha moments are associated with learning representational change, but they also feel really satisfying and pleasurable. So the question is sort of like, is the change part related to the feel good part? And what does this tell us about the human epistemic system? Why are we motivated to learn and solve problems? And can we use this to improve learning and creativity? Um, we know that like aha experiences are, are a pleasurable experience and they're uh, influenced by mood. So I already mentioned positive mood seems to influence the frequency and accuracy of insight if you're in a better positive mood, you solve more problems with insight, you rate insight experiences more strongly, um, and you also tend to be more accurate. Um, separately, reward sensitivity, which is a trait, it's like the uh, BAS uh, component of this BAS, um, might influence how insight is experienced. Um, uh, reward responsiveness reflects differences in the tendency to detect, pursue, learn from, and derive pleasure from positive stimuli. So uh, people who are like more hedonistic are more sensitive to rewards. These are the same people, you know, when that becomes um, uh, disordered, it can manifest like substance abuse disorder or eating disorders or um, addiction, things like that. Um, I think of like Benjamin Franklin as someone who's sort of like canonically hedonistic about all the other things, all the things in his life, including creative problem solving. Um, and it suggests that there's a sort of like, it's the same underlying mechanism driving that. And in a recent study in our lab, actually, we showed that um, 
Individuals who are higher in reward sensitivity as a trait um, showed unique neural activity associated with um, solving problems with insight. So it didn't change the number of insights that people had, but it people who are higher in reward sensitivity had more um, activity in reward related regions. Um, so the orbital frontal cortex we were using EEG and that was not present in individuals who are low in reward sensitivity. So um, it doesn't change how many insights you have, but it makes them feel better. So if you're high reward sensitive, these experiences might feel better. So there's some sort of relationship here between aha experiences, positive mood and epistemic rewards that sort of um, should be unpacked. Um, looking at both data sets combined because the um, data was very similar across both. Um, what we actually saw is that really positive mood was the only um, individual difference that was strongly or even significantly correlated with aha strength, which is very surprising. Um, I measured like 30 things <laughs> and positive mood is the thing that makes people have strong aha moments. Um, but what was interesting is looking at people's mood at the end. So we measured their mood right after they finished the analogies and people who were in a better mood at the end um, were higher in reward sensitivity and some measures of curiosity um, and extroversion and conscientiousness. So um, what that suggested was a mediation analysis actually. Um, so uh, we were interested in whether having aha experiences during these sorts of like creative analogical reasoning tasks would make people be happier, would make them in a better mood. And we do see this modest increase in positive mood over the course of the experiment. Um, I think it's cool, I'm biased. Maybe some people were just happy that the experiment was over, um, but I think that um, you, you know, a lot of tasks that we make people do are sort of hard. Um, so the fact that people liked it or seem to have liked it, um, what we actually see is that, so being in a positive mood at the start makes you more likely to have strong insights. This is particularly true for the expansive analogies. And then the stronger insights you had, the better mood you were in at the end. So the strength of the aha experiences that you had over the course of the experiment uh, significantly mediated mood from the beginning to the end of the experiment. And the same thing was true for trait reward sensitivity. So if you were higher in trait reward sensitivity, you were in a better mood at the end of the experiment. And there was actually this bi significant bi-directional relationship between positive mood at the start and reward sensitivity. Um, it is significant in both directions and we can't disambiguate because this is correlational, um, the direction of causality here. Um, people who are high in trait reward sensitivity, there is a sort of modest, um, stable relationship with positive mood, um, but also um, we don't know if um, it could be influencing uh, the sort of um, uh, being in a better mood at the beginning of the experiment, experiment could sort of influence the way that trait is expressed. Um, but there's no relationship between reward sensitivity and aha moments, which means that these two different um, uh, things are sort of separate mediators of mood. These discrete aha experiences that you're having, as well as your trait reward sensitivity. Um, and what was interesting is that the same thing was true for a subscale of the curiosity scale called joyous exploration, which is essentially equivalent to openness to experience, sort of intellectual curiosity. Um, how much do you find pleasure from finding out new information and sort of discovering things? Um, and so that also was a significant mediator of the relationship between mood from the beginning and end of the experiment. And um, to me, this suggests that, you know, yes, the aha experiences are the result of analogical mapping, but even just this act of making these associative, interesting, novel relationships, it's pleasurable, particularly for people who have this trait. Um, probably a lot of people in this uh, chat or this session do a lot of researchers. Um, in this case, joyous exploration was um, marginally related to the strength of aha experiences. So there's definitely some relationships that need to be unpacked there. This was all correlational, so I'm gonna be doing some follow-up experiments, but I did wanna share this.
Um, so the high level conclusions were that being in a positive mood makes those aha moments stronger or more salient. It also boosts your mood as a result. So there's a sort of virtuous cycle there. Um, people who are higher in reward sensitivity and intellectual curiosity may get more reward or a bigger boost in mood from sort of analogical aha moments, but due to an indirect effect. So there's the discrete positive experiences of having the aha moments, but there's also the sort of like general positive affect that results of sort of like considering these analogical relationships. <laughs> Um, there's a really interesting paper that I came across um, by Moshe Barr. Uh, it was a theoretical paper in Trends in Cognitive Science, um, suggesting that associative processing could have a bidirectional effect on mood. So if you're in a positive mood, you're more likely to sort of seek out or be able to access sort of like distant associations and reason in a more associative way. And then that also can make you in a more positive mood. And that the disruption of that cycle um, uh, can manifest in like depressive symptoms and or it could be considered sort of an intervention for um, like anhedonic individuals. Um, that sort of there's a, um, that yeah, simply making these associations can influence people's mood. But the nature of these relationships needs clarification. So I definitely have some work to do. But overall, I think that this sort of has some implications for understanding epistemic emotions associated with learning and creativity and aesthetic appreciation um, of which relational reasoning um, obviously plays a big role. Um, so that's all I have for today. Um, thank you for, for listening. Um, let me know if you have any questions or feedback. I have, I would like to eventually get my PhD. So if people have ideas, feedback, please let me know. Um, I'd really appreciate it.